The drug war and cyber, I would say, are two of the most misprosecuted, and misunderstood, uh, and contentious areas of, of law that we face in America today. And Ross is smack in the middle of those two. I'm Zach Weissmuller for Reason TV. We're here at the Silent Movie Theater in Los Angeles for a screening of Deep Web, a new documentary by director and producer Alex Winter. Alex, thanks for talking to us. Thank you. Deep Web is about a kind of encrypted version of the internet that you need a special browser to access and people use cryptocurrencies to buy things that maybe they're not supposed to buy. But at its heart, it's a personal portrait of Ross Ulbricht, the creator of the notorious online black market, Silk Road. Let's start there. What is your impression of Ross Ulbricht from what you've been able to piece together during the movie? I don't have a concrete impression of Ross. The movie is really about what I do and don't know and what my impressions are and aren't, which is, in a way, he's whatever anybody tr uh, decides to impose upon this idea of who he is. His parents and his family members uh, see him as this very good-hearted, peaceful, pacifistic, brilliant young man that they've known their whole lives who had no criminal tendencies and, and no even hostile tendencies. Uh, the libertarian community has sort of embraced him because of his libertarian politics as being somewhat of a hero on the libertarian side. The crypto anarchists have said, no, he's actually not a libertarian. He goes farther than the libertarians. He's more of a, an anarchist. He's more of a revolutionary. Law enforcement and the government, of course, has branded him as sort of this nefarious, murderous Walter White of the internet age, this corrupted, evil uh, drug overlord. So really, there's a very uh, almost kaleidoscopic impression that I have as to who Ross is. Um, it's possible that some of those ideas are wrong. It's possible that some version of all of them are right. In a sort of postscript to the film, Ross was sentenced. And in a shocking move, the judge actually went above and beyond what the prosecutors were even asking for and gave him a life sentence. What's your reaction to that? It was the first time, I think, for myself that I felt categorically that there had been something unjust occurring. Uh, no matter what Ross was guilty of, no matter what he did or didn't do, no matter what aspect of what he had been charged with, uh, he truly had done. Uh, a life sentence without parole is, is shockingly extreme. Secondarily, the, the bluntness uh, by which the judge communicated why she was pr pronouncing this sentence what took everyone really by surprise. She gave a very impassioned speech basically in defense of the drug war and in defense of the, what she called the social fabric that needed to be defended, and which she felt Ross and technologies like the technologies that Ross was uh, connected to, not even created, but even tangentially connected to, uh, disrupted the social fabric and were dangerous, and therefore she had to make an example of him. It's interesting because, you know, you said you have this kind of kaleidoscopic view of Ross and everyone sees their own little sliver of what he is. And apparently that extends to federal judges as well, because she saw him as some sort of symbol. The one thing he did that was the most dangerous to his own uh, future was to insert himself in the crosshairs of the cyber criminal world and law and the drug war. And the drug war and cyber, I would say, are two of the most misprosecuted, misunderstood, uh, and contentious areas of, of law that we face in America today. And Ross is smack in the middle of those two. And I think that had a lot to do with the severity of his sentence. So you're maintaining kind of distance and a skepticism towards what Ross did and didn't do. And one of the most controversial aspects of him as a character in the media are these allegations that he ordered several hits uh, against enemies of the Silk Road, people who were threatening to unveil the anonymity that was the whole point of the market. What do you make of those allegations? It's really hard to say. There are two sort of prongs to those murder allegations. There are there's the diaries, which were found on Ross's computer, right. which were not continuous journals. There were a, a, only a couple of entries made. And then suddenly, apparently in 13, when the most nefarious activity was going on, when Ross claims he wasn't even involved in the Silk Road, he started journaling like crazy about all these really heinous criminal acts. So you believe those were fabricated? I, I don't know. All I know is that as a, as a documentarian, I certainly do not feel it is within my right, knowing the power of a documentary 
and a power of a movie. And if I put forward a theory, it's taken as tacit fact. And I think that it's, I think frankly, from a journalistic standpoint as well, it's extremely irresponsible to fall hard on one side or the other of allegations involving murder that have not been charged, much less proven. You know, from a commercial filmmaking standpoint, it would have been great to say, sure, this guy is, you know, Walter White of the internet. I mean, I probably, the movie would have probably made tens of millions of dollars, but it's irresponsible. Stepping back from Ulbricht a little bit and looking at the broader deep web and the dark net, um, in making this film, how have you come to view that wider project? A lot of people use the dark net for privacy and anonymity. The idea that there's this thing called the deep web that is 10 times larger than the visible internet that's filled with criminals is nonsense. It's just a falsehood. Uh, the deep web is just this giant gobbledygook of data, and a tiny little fraction of that is the dark net. And there's a subset of that where there's some criminal activity going on, but even that tiny little fraction of the dark net is mostly privacy and anonymity. Hmm. But the, the fear that people have of that subsection, people are afraid that it's inevitably going to be used to sell drugs and firearms. And however you feel about that, there's other things that are even worse, you know, child porn, assassinations. Do you, does that kind of thing concern you? Do you think that it's, people should really be afraid of that? Here's what concerns me. What concerns me is the misunderstanding of and the mythologizing of this space. Mm -hmm. This the darknet and, and tools like Tor are just tools. They're nothing more. Criminal activity occurs everywhere human beings congregate. To say that you are pro-Tor does not mean that you're pro-child abuse. Just to say that being pro-New York City does not mean that I am pro-street crime just because there is street crime in New York City. From my perspective, it's absurd. Um, it's worse than absurd in that I think there's an, uh, somewhat of an agenda behind the demonizing and mythologizing of these technologies. And I think that agenda is to prevent average citizens from having privacy and anonymity in the digital space because it's threatening on a number of levels. Making a movie about anonymity, you brought some characters in front of the camera that are naturally people that do not want to go in front of the camera. They're cloaking themselves with all this encryption. Mm -hmm. Was it difficult? Was the process of getting them to talk to you difficult? And just if you can take us behind the scenes a little bit, how did you manage to get these people to talk to you? Well, I've been involved in that space for a long time, for 20 years or so. So I have a lot of connections in that world. All the core architects, the motive for the people who got involved in, in the Silk Road, they were coming from the Occupy movement. They were, they were you know, uh, vigorously anti-drug war. They wanted to use technology to change policy. These were political people. Interesting. So because they were political people and not just your average drug dealer, they wanted to talk. I've gotten a lot of communication from people since the movie came out thanking me for the film and saying this is actually what it felt like to be in the Silk Road as opposed to how it's been represented in the media. And it wasn't about glorifying it. It wasn't like I tried to say this is a good thing. It was just because I showed that it was a political engine first and foremost. What do you see with the future of the deep web and the dark net and separately of Ross Ulbricht? Well, Ross is going to appeal. Um, and I would like to see them win an appeal. Is there a particular, particularly strong grounds for appeal that you think uh, might be the route? Yeah, I think, that, I think that the sentencing being so harsh, making an example of a young man you're basically putting in max for 50 or 60 years, it's you know, tantamount to torture. So you know, that's what the Unabomber gets. And then to your second question, you know, the dark net, I, I did this movie on Napster, which was all about, you know, looking at peer-to-peer -peer file sharing more as, as sort of birth of global communities online than music sharing. And I would say Silk Road is very similar. Silk Road is really the next big watershed technology in the history of the evolution of online community. It brought so many people together, but it brought them together anonymously. It's a big leap forward. As you've seen in the, in the markets, this is the beginning. This is not the end of anything. The, 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 they're gonna become decentralized. They're gonna proliferate at an enormous rate. Privacy is becoming a booming business in the post-Snowden era. So we're at the beginning of an era of understanding uh, our right as citizens to privacy online, and that is going to grow. It's not going to shrink. Alex Winter, thank you very much for talking to us. The movie is Deep Web. You can watch it on Epix. It'll be available for download on iTunes and all other VOD platforms at the end of this summer. For Reason TV, I'm Zach Weissmuller.